Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we are going to be covering again uh, the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. We're going to be diving in. We're going to be seeing uh, a a theme that is purely about Paul preaching a simple gospel. That we don't need to muddy it up or make it complex or, or add to God's work. We just need to do what he's told us to do. We're going to see that that theme just permeates out from this scripture. It's the last half of chapter 1, from verse 18 um, through the end. And, and Paul, in this section, not only is he driving home the simplicity of the gospel, but the power behind the simplicity. Maybe uh, in your church you know, life, uh, you, you've seen people try and come up with strategies or uh, some sort of plan uh, that, that, you know, to, to get more people in the church or to um, grow a ministry. That's never been God's way. It's been man's way to do that. But um, truth is, is we're not called to use man's way. And so I want to dive in. I want to take a look at what God's plan is for the growth of his church and his people. And we'll see that it's in simplicity, which, by the way, should encourage each one of us. Because if it's a difficult task, then uh, we should be overwhelmed. But if it's simple, it's not something to be overwhelmed by. It's something to be uh, encouraged to engage in. And that's what I hope you leave with today, is encouragement to engage in the mission and work of Jesus Christ. So, let's dive in. I'm going to read it, pray over us, and then our time, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll discuss it uh, pretty informally. So, it says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is power, the power of God, to those who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for a sign, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to those Gentiles. Yet to those who are called both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many noble of birth. Instead, God has chosen the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world what is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So, The very first thing that we find is a contrast. It's a contrast of foolishness and power. And he says, For the word of God is foolishness to those who are perishing, 
but it is power to God but it is the power of God to those who are being saved. So there's a foolishness and a power. And the foolishness uh, is how, we're, how the world views God's uh, plan. What was God's plan? It says, for the word of the cross. In other words, the message of the cross. The message of the cross. Now, we hear that and think in a uh, 21st century mindset. We know the cross in one light, but it's not the same as the way the people that when this was written would have viewed that message. You see, to take it out of its old context and put it into more modern context, it's, it's like saying, uh, you know, the message of the electric chair is uh, God's power. Now, we would be astounded if someone stood up behind a pulpit on a Sunday morning and said that. You'd be like, what are you talking about? People would be walking and bailing out the back. Uh, Everyone's thinking, I'm definitely not drinking any Kool-Aid they're serving or taking any shoes from them, right? And and the thing is, is that what God's saying is um, that that form or that message in which he says it's through Jesus' suffering on that cross, his payment um, for your uh, not making uh, the, the way to perfection um, that he did. He lived the perfect life. He did everything perfect so that he could pay for your penalty for not making, uh, for sinning, for, for missing the mark. He, he paid that. And, and that someone else would pay for you and have to suffer on your behalf. The world, it says, looks at that and says, dude, that's foolish. I would never go and, and conquer um, the greatest battle in all humanity, evil versus good, in that fashion. But it is the power of God to those being saved. Let me ask a question from the very beginning. Do you feel like the message of the cross is foolishness? Or do you feel like it's power? That that's where you gain your power? And maybe it's because you've misunderstood or someone spun it in a way that didn't quite um, paint it properly. You see, Paul's trying to clear that up here. Paul actually says that, uh, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Now, I know that sounds like uh, it's, it's literally uh, advocating the same message that people that are atheists do about Christians. Their, their message about Christians and atheists would say uh, that you have to throw your intellect away to have faith. And it sounds like he says that, that but, but he doesn't. He says, I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligence. Where's the one, here's where a little clarity comes in. He says, where's the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where's the debater of the sage? Who's he referring to? In, in the last study, we, he talked about the Pharisees. He talked about the, the Greeks. And, and the Jews and the Greeks had um, an area in which they focused on power. Where he says, where's the one who is wise? He's talking about the Greek. Why? Because the Greeks in that time were all about uh, great speakers and philosophers and people that could bring a new kind of new wisdom. Give me a new message, a new way of living. Uh, you know, we, we have that in our own culture today, right? You can look on Instagram and see on uh, five minutes of feed, 18 different new ways to live a life. And that's essentially what they were promoting, a new way of life, a, a wisdom of this age. And that was important to the Greeks. And so he's saying, hey, where's, your, where's the Greeks that, that believe in this wisdom that they have? Or where is the teacher of the law? He's talking about the Jews, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees. So he's talking about this, this, um, these people that the Greeks found their power in knowledge. You ever heard the saying, uh, knowledge is power? Well, that, that literally comes from, derives from that, that ancient Greek uh, ideology the jews 
found their power in keeping of the law. That if they kept the law, that they had the power of God behind them. But it was really in their own ability, right? And then he says, where's the debater of this age? In other words, hey, if I missed anybody, uh, if you want to argue the point, bring it on. Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believed through the foolishness of what is preached. So, he doesn't want to use man's wisdom, plain and simple. He wants to use God's wisdom. Now, what does that look like? This is for the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. Like I said before, they're seeking signs because a sign signified that whoever was, had, had, could have the ability to do these signs, they brought power to the table and they would follow him. And, and the Greeks sought out wisdom. They would follow the, the great teachers of the day. But he says that, but we preach Christ crucified. So they're seeking a wisdom, they're seeking a sign, they're seeking power, and they're seeking power. But we seek a different kind of power, or power through something different. What is that? Christ crucified. You see, in the fact that someone else would pay the penalty, or suffer my penalty, that is the power that gives me the free pass. It wasn't free, it did cost someone, but God gave grace. And, and why is that important? Because you know what that creates that the other two don't create? You see, they want to take it by force. Give me someone with power, either knowledge or ability, and I will follow them. Why? Because that leader can go conquer nations. But you see, what God was Im- impressed with was not conquering nations, but conquering sin. And, and he's wanting not to conquer man's kingdoms, but get you into his kingdom. And so, so what, what is he trying to drive at here? He's saying, but we, we need to beat something with a, a deeper power, a power over sin. And the only thing that can do that is someone needs to pay for that. And so he actually went on a higher level. But see, the people of this world look at that as a lower level. Why? Because they're not interested in the next life. They're interested in the here and now. It's not us. We look at what can you do for me now? What have you done for me lately, right? Yet, he says that it's a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. I love it. For those that are seeking um, the wrong motive, they, they want a leader here. They want to conquer the people that were over them. The Jews, hey, I don't blame them. They wanted someone to, to go after the Romans and, and knock them out and let them live their, in their own land again under their own ruling. But God, God thinks so much bigger than we do. He wasn't just thinking about the here and now because they would die in their sin and end up in hell. Well, that's not going to be helpful. So the Lord's thinking on a much bigger scale. He could deal with your enemies but he, and give you freedom. But ultimately, it won't matter if you're just going to perish. Now, he says in verse 24, Yet to those who are called both Jews and Greeks. So he's not excluding them altogether. What he's saying is, if if you come, anyone from any group, if you come to me under my way, then Christ is power, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You'll you'll see it, but you have to walk in it. You have to trust him, and, and you'll start to see that he is wise, that he He has brought power because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now, what that does when we're not trusting in man, we're trusting in God and we're we're having to trust in faith, it makes us dependent. The other one makes us arrogant. Oh, I got a leader. My guy's just he's he's the man he can he can speak he's got wisdom he's got the newest uh, uh way of of life uh that he that he espouses and and we're following 
or uh, he's got the ability to, or she's got the ability to do something miraculous and, and wow people. Well, that's great and all, but the truth is, is uh, God here wants us dependent on him, dependent on his power, his strength, not ours, not one that one of our people have, but him. That means that we would be in relationship with Him. That means that we would learn to grow in our, our walk with Him. He's wise. He's a good Father, and that's why He literally does it that way. So that in um, this moment uh, of relationship, we find ourselves humbling ourselves and going to Him for the power, for the miraculous, and for the wisdom He says, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from human perspective. Not many are powerful. Not many are of noble birth. I want to clarify one thing real quick. Not many means that there are some that are wise. There's some by human perspective. There are some that are powerful. And there are some that are of noble birth. But not many. And the reason why is because God has instead, he has chosen what is foolish in this world. Might not sit well with you right now, but think about it. He's chosen foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And he has chosen the insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing. To bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that, here's the reason, no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, his way brings us to a place of dependency. We don't have anything to brag about. Keeps us humble. And that's a good place to be because uh, I know what it's like to be arrogant and a child. I I have children of my own. We go to the skate park often. I'm I'm an uh, ex-skateboarder. Well, I'm a skateboarder now, but an ex-sponsored skateboarder. And so I like to teach my daughter and my sons how to do different tricks and how to ride. And, and I got uh, a daughter who's 10 years old and she's dropping in on uh, nine foot walls. Uh, they're, they're pretty big. And one mistake can be very, very costly. Very costly. And so I really need her to be, to be dependent on me in one sense. I need her to listen because I have better wisdom than she does. When she doesn't listen and she just starts being arrogant and not not dependent, she ends up hurting herself quite often or getting frustrated. But when she's obedient and humbles herself and listens, she grows exponentially. She just thrives in the environment. And that's what God's intention for us is, is that we would go to him and trust in him. Now, he's talking about salvation in general, but let's face it, salvation is not an ongoing thing because, yes, we're saved and enter into his family and become a part of his kingdom. But the rest of our life is called sanctification. It's a cleansing of our life, and that's being saved not just from uh, the power of sin at one moment, but from the presence of sin. So we need to be saved from the presence of sin. And we learn and grow through that. Uh, but it, it needs to come about from being dependent on Him. It starts in dependence and it ends in dependence on Jesus. For me, in particular, I, I want to share uh, a bit of my own experience in this. I, I remember being um, a new Christian 
and thinking, well, I got to do something and clean up my life, right? That would be bringing my own power, my own works to this circumstance. So I felt I got to clean up my own life and then I'll go to God. And it wasn't until I couldn't clean up my life anymore and I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried for so many years. And then one day I threw up my fist at God uh, with one finger up. I wasn't happy. I was pissed off and I was trying to please him. And I finally just got fed up and I said, God, I'm done. I can't do this. I keep trying and I can't clean my life up. And literally that's when I felt I, one of the times I felt I, I experienced his power uh, more tangible than ever. He reached down from heaven and said, literally I heard this soft, still voice in my heart. It was an impression that basically said, that's what I've been waiting for, for you to realize that you can't do it. Now I'll show you my strength. It was that day that I stopped uh, doing $3,600 worth of drugs a month. My wife and I calculated it up. That's on average what I was spending. About $1,000 in alcohol um, and a, like a, a pack and a half of cigarettes a day immediately whew, had no desire for either, any of them gone the power of God but it required me being dependent and in that moment quite frankly not even very good I mean I wouldn't have I kind of came at him like a brat throwing a tantrum yet he was still merciful there's been other times where wisdom was what I was seeking. I thought, I went to the School of Ministry for pastoral training with Calvary Chapel, and I thought, I've been taught by the best teachers in the world. I mean, my goodness, I was able to sit under Chuck Smith, who left a massive legacy, and learn scripture verse by verse from him. I thought, Lord, obviously, now that you've given me, you know, this, this uh, degree in, in theology and, and this understanding of pastoral ministry, apparently, Lord, you've been needing a new Billy Graham. And I thought, by all the wisdom that I had gotten, that God was going to, I was like, Lord, just show me, point me in the direction, get out of the way, I, I got this. I was leaning on my own understanding. Nope. God would have no part in it. He kept me back from ministry over and over and over and over and over. And notice that um, it never sits well with half of the church, but he says, I use the foolish things. I use the weak things. One translation says, I use the base things. The word in the original language means garbage. The, the, the stuff that we literally would throw away, he wants to use that. I qualify. It's the only reason I could tell you that I'm actually doing these videos or sharing the gospel or seeing fruit come about. Because at the end of the day, I'm not, though I went to school for ministry, for pastoral training, truth is, Chuck Smith, he failed for 17 years in ministry before God humbled him enough to use him. I've failed many years in ministry. And the same thing. God had to humble me. Knock me down quite a bit of notches to get me to a usable place. Weak. God has taken away my physical strength. Uh, I've had a lot of physical ailments that now... Uh, later in life, I'm always thinking to myself, God, when I was younger, I was so much more, I had so much zeal, I was so much less tired, I was so much more energy and, and, and uh, vitality. Why wouldn't you use that? And he goes, no, no. But wait till you beat up, tired, broken, um, where you don't have a feeling that you can do this on your own or strength. And that's where he makes his best work. Do you feel weak? Do you feel humbled? Do you feel broken? Do you feel like maybe you've been thrown out? People don't care, you're garbage. 
the scripture today ought to really encourage you because it says that God has a use for people like that. God has a use for people that feel like they're done. It's not till we come to our end that he actually sees his beginning in us and through us. So I want to pray for you guys. And I just want to honestly ask God to do a work in all of our hearts. Because, uh, hey, the reality is the gospel needs to go out. And like I said last uh, message, uh, he's going to use a lot of different personalities, a lot of different people. And we're ripe and ready for, uh, after a pandemic, to, to see God move in radical ways. So I want to pray for you that God would uh, start to work in your heart and in your life. Father, we come before you. Through the work of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit, we ask, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in everyone that's going to watch this video. Lord, everyone that's going to uh, hear these words, Lord, would your spirit fall upon us and help us to trust in your ways, in your gospel message that seems foolish to the world. But Lord, we know it's wisdom and we know it's, it's power. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to rest in you, to trust in your work. I thank you. I praise you. And ask this for my brothers and sisters and myself. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. Until then, read ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 2.